artist i'm a musician um i draw and i'm also a cook yeah i work as a I work as a chef in a brewery but the thing for me that is seems I, counterintuitive very, i'm a chef at a brewery i bake beer i do bake beer <laughs> i make beer bread <laughs> but i i don't know i my um my relationship with comics have been very weird i sometimes feel very intimidated or sometimes like because for me like sometimes like comedians are very they're very funny they're very upfront and it's just like you got to get into that zone and i don't know how to do it i don't know how to fucking do it it's just bananas yeah well the reason I know how to do it is because that's what I've been doing my entire life. I know. I always, that's people insane, always, bro. Like, every time I do an interview, they always ask the question, like, oh, so how did you get into comedy? It's like, uh, because I don't want to work a real job. That's why. I don't want to sit in an office with lights, and this is how I figure out how to do it. No, because what I when I do stand – me doing stand-up is what I was doing at parties. Like, get, getting a crowd of people to, to gather around me while I tell jokes and stories and be generally humorous and funny. Or, for some people – annoying one or the other it's basically one or the other but it's like i was already doing this in one form you know like i grew up uh i was born in 81 so i grew up during the the late 70s or 80s comedy boom so for me stand-up comedy was everywhere i learned it as a small kid i watched stand-up like seeing like every Richard single Pryor. night on tv yeah like but, but with network tv like it was all right. over the place like i didn't have cable growing up because we couldn't afford it until my dad, you know, hooked up, a, you know, got a hook up on a black box and then we could get illegal cable, which right. my dad allegedly gave up all his criminal activity when he met my mother. No, he didn't. He just figured out how to do it without making her mad. That's Bro, like it, people, but- pe- people forget, you know, like I grew up in the early 2000s, but here's the deal. OK, there was a time when we had cell phones, but it was very expensive. I remember my dad paying somewhere like in the neighborhood of like $120 a month for like a thousand minutes and 200 text. Bro, like, I got my first fo- cell phone at 19 in 1999 when I started college. I was given 20 free minutes of airtime a month. Like <laughs> it's, <laughs> was it was terrible. You know, dude. Do you want to know how many f- phone numbers I could save into my phone? Zero. It didn't have memory to do that. It was you had to re- still remember everyone's phone number. Yeah, or it, it, some. I um, my dad had a, a coworker. I'll never forget this. He used to have. Um, he used to carry around a black book. You know, back in the day. Oh yeah, a little notebook with everyone's phone numbers in it. Yeah, yeah. phone book. Yeah. So he was. He was like an old. My school uncle's guy. and father's black books was full of what numbers people were gambling on when they were running numbers when they were bookies. <laughs> And they had their phone numbers in it, so they knew how to hunt them down <laughs> when they wouldn't pay their bills. No, like, dude, the funny part was, like, this dude was, like, a construction guy, and he just had, like, his black book. You know, like, he had a cell phone on one side, you know, and he had, like, his black book in, like, in a satchel. So it kind of looked, like, as if he had, like, a gun in there, you know? But it was just, like, this fucking book, man. <gasps> Those were the days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as a comedian, I'm well familiar with walking around with notebooks because... I have tons of notebooks that I'm writing in. No, life has not turned digital yet for this comedian. It did for a little while. And I realized somebody said to me once that the way our brains work, another comedian, a guy I respect. So I'll take his word for it. It's not just some other random white white guy that was like, I'm going to start a podcast and just talk about why we should say the N word. But uh, a guy who's actually smart and funny and whose opinion I actually believe in uh, said to me that, there's a studies done that what, there's a disconnect between your brain and a, and a screen. Like we are trained our bodies to look at lights and screens as a force of entertainment and it hypnotizes us and zones us out. So when you're working on a screen, 
your body's not taking in, your brain's not taking in the information it needs to. Pen and paper, your body still connects with, your brain still connects with that part of the writing, that hand movement and everything. It helps you to remember things better and it helps you to connect better with what it is that you're putting down. I don't know if it's true, but I've been writing in notebooks for a while now and I like it. I enjoy it. Well, did there, I still write did, in a notebook, like in the phone. Like it's if I have a quick quip in my head, it's easier to write it in the phone. It looks less weird than me going through my bag, pulling out my notebook, finding my pen, finding a page, scrolling through, and just like right. Well, I, I think and then, then you know going back to the world where I can just pull my phone out, write it in notes at, save it, and then look at it later. Which I did. I just did last night. Last night I was looking through my phone for the notes that I wrote about the thing I was going to talk about and then rewrote them on paper. Doesn't it all depend on the artist though? I mean, cause there are, again, there's nothing wrong with being old school The you know, there are some benefits. I mean, everyone has their methods. Every have yeah, their, for sure. Yeah, everyone has their, their, their way of doing it. It's just all subjective. Like but for same thing you, with writing music, found... some people like to write tablature. Some people like to write notes. Some people like to write in voice memos, you know, everyone has their own right. thing. Um, and that's, you know, what's just what I've chosen to do. You feel There's more no com- right or wrong way. There's, you feel more you know, comfortable this way. Like you feel like you're writing the way that you give off your comedy when you're doing your shows. Um, yeah, I'm producing. I like right. And it comes down to that physical, out, physical alley. Like I wrote it down in a piece of paper. It's now a thing. You know, where if if, if I just type in my phone, it's just something that's in my phone. Like it, we've introduced 3D touch. Feel, smell, you know, writing in this connects all five senses. And I trust me, I'm not that hippy dippy of a guy who's like, oh, it's all about the inspiration and the muse and the feelings of the world transcending into your. No, I'm not. Bring on me. Joke joke writing is joke writing. It's set up, it's punchline, (laughs) that's it. I'm very utilitarian about it. Like, I I really want to break this stigma that comedy is divine inspiration from the gods. I have to wait for the muse to come. Bless me with the lightning of brilliance into my brain. No, you fucking write a joke. You write a setup. You write a punchline. It's formulaic. And then I love the people who are like, oh, there's no joke writing has no formula. Joke ri- telling jokes is 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 uh, it's it's art. I'm like, no, it's a fucking parlor trick, right? Stephen King has structure to his stories, right? Yeah. Scripts, movies. Have structures. Novels have stories. Those structures. So Song do jokes. Songwriters too. Yeah. And the best joke writers are the ones that can write a joke and not show you the structure. Right. That's you know that's the true artistry of this. Is is that's the true talent is being able to give you a product that's going to make you laugh without you seeing it coming, without you seeing part A is connected to part B, and then part C connects back down back around to A or whatever. Yeah, like I. This kind of reminds me of. <clears throat> I'm kind of a little bit of a fan of Shane Gillis and Shane's one great. of the things, yeah, like one of the things I love about his comedy is it's very relatable. Like the second I hear a bit from him, I'm like, Oh yeah, I've definitely like ran into a situation like that before. And I just like, just like a matter of a second, I like click. I'm like, I understand what he's saying. And it's just words. It's just words put in a sentence said a certain way that it's funny, but like, Getting that clarity, as an artist, I can see that there was work that was put in to do that. Like, he didn't just wake up one day, like you said, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, I have this revelation that fucking hot stewardess will kick your fucking ass if you speak shit to her. Oh yeah, she'll wrap you up in like fucking duct tape, you know, and cellophane and fucking lock you in the, you know, in like the little trolley, you know, with all the little drinks, you know, make sure you don't drink any of them, you know? Like yeah, that I mean, kind of I'm situation. sure he sat down with an idea and a concept and he wrote yeah. down, he went through different thing, different thing, different thing till he found what works the best out of it, you know, and some of the things that he got rid of probably worked, but they didn't work for this reason or they, they stopped working for another reason or whatever, whatever it is. But you're yeah, saying it's, it's like a it's, parlor trick in a way. Yeah, which I no, it's, it's in my, in my opinion, joke writing is 100% formula. Like, 100%. Look at, I mean, yeah, 100% for me. It's, it's literally every single joke you've ever heard is set up punchline. 
That's it. That's it's two two parts. Set up punchline, and then if, if you want to get really detailed, in it, there's tags, and all a tag is is a punchline that uses the previous punchline as a setup. So it's like all jokes telling is set up punchline, set up punchline. Well, what creates a good punchline? Then you once you learn how to uh, that, that's the artistry there is learning how to create punchlines. All right. Well, right. you have an expectation, and then you have to betray that expectation to elicit an un. The, 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 uh, uh, release brain fart it it happens it, it's like methane gas that comes out of a cow Un- unintentional have... <laughs> reaction unintentional is not the word i was looking for but it works in the scenario that i'm creating so basically you have a setup and you have to create a punchline the punchline elicits an, uh, a reaction for you that you were not planning to do you have to betray right. that setup example you know slipping on a ban- banana peel right your setup is a person walking with nothing happening. You're betraying that application with the punchline of he slips and falls on the piano peel, right? We can laugh at that because it was unexpected to see him fall, fall unbeknownst to his own self and watch it, you know, like reaction that's videos. All comedy is. Yeah. That's all comedy is the setup and punchline, whether it's verbal visual in any way, shape or form. Look at the dumb meme of the dude walking down the street with his arm around the girl and looking back. The expectation is he should be paying attention to his girlfriend, but we're betraying that by him looking at another woman and her feeling betrayed by it. It's the setup. The expectation is he should be paying attention to the woman he's with. The comedy comes by, Hey, look, he's not, he's looking at something else because misogyny that's you know you know what's so <laughs> ironic toxic about, male masculinity. You, know, you know what's so ironic about those videos bro is the fact that there are cats there are cats and dogs that are more famous than most celebrities oh okay i have a joke in my act when i was talking about i was working on a tv an actual cbs tv show where the main character is running along the Charles River with his dog. And I say, do you know how embarrassing it is that you recognize a dog because it has better IMDB credits than you do? <laughs> yeah, it, there's there, the setup, the expectation of, <laughs> hey, here's a dog. The portrayal of this just being a normal dog is that I'm jealous of this dog because it's more famous than I am. <laughs> Bro. It's I mean, crazy. music has structure it's... too. Like, look, I mean, we. Dude, music is just math. Jokes are math. It's a formula. A plus B equals laughter. You know, same thing with music. Music is mathematics, right? Why why are we listening to a certain note? Because that note vibrates at a particular frequency that vibrates the air. And that, we've accepted that 44 kilohertz or whatever it is, is a C note. All right? I'm not... Music nerds, don't don't punish me if I got those actual numbers wrong. But we know that if the vibration at a, at a certain frequency per minute equals this note, the Greeks figured that out a hundred, five hundred, seven hundred, a thousand years ago. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a I'm not a historian. Actually, I do work it's, in history, but it's, I am not a historian. It's, it's, Greek. About. It's about it's about it's a little a little close to three thousand years ago. But yeah. okay, yeah, sure. I have no idea. I'm not a historian, right? I went to six years of community college and didn't graduate. Okay. There's a reason why I'm here telling you about jokes and we're not having a discussion about actual factual history, right? No, no, no. You, I don't know. Look, like I, I am a little bit of a history buff. You are correct. One of the greatest advancements of the Greek empire was mathematics. And the interesting thing about was that they created like the very first idea of like a class so people would gather around somebody that has studied this, you know, has an hypothesis, and they would discuss this calculation, and they would work together. I, if like moving now, we have now colleges. What's a college? You have a professor, and you have a bunch of students, and the professor says his knowledge, and he asks questions. Here's the students' opinions, tests you know, figure out again, because they're working towards something new. You know, when somebody goes to college and I, I'm not a big college person. I'm just using this as an example, but (laughs) by the way, yeah, I like you. You're a historian talking about the invention of schooling and teaching and passing things on. Meanwhile, I previously just gave you all the knowledge I know about music and Greeks that I learned from Donald Duck in Mathland from Disney. All right. So <laughs> there's a difference. Well, 
my thing was is I couldn't stand math and I was so bored that I went to the local I went to the local library and I found comics. Comic books mm -hmm. and graphic novels. Like the National Geographics. I have dyslexia. So I was like one of those kids. I was like, I hated school so much. I would go to the library and find picture books to keep myself entertained. So I, I, I feel your pain. I feel your pain, man. But yeah, like it, it's honestly about those things, right? Where you say, oh my God, this is a new thing. No, it's not been around for fucking a th like thousands of years. Yeah, I mean, just, I mean, they found jokes graffitied on the walls of Pompeii. There you go. Yeah. Dick jokes, because universally talking about your genitalia has always been funny. I mean, it's, for God's sake, it's the Roman Empire, okay? <laughs> like, hello? Hey, look, Every, actually, the Roman Empire, yeah. they had penises too. Oh, yeah, they loved penises. Like, if you ever seen Roman statues, it's just a penis factory of marble. Yeah, everywhere. and none of them impressive. No. That's the worst part, is people are like, you know what? Hey, I'm going to, uh, you hey, over the egg, I'm going to go naked, and I'm going to show you my tiny little pee, and then you're going to sculpt it. You're going to spend hours staring at my tiny little pee. Yeah, it's actually they hilarious. They weren't even like it's tuna cans. <laughs> they, so they were just, they were tiny. barely, barely Italian micro penises. It was, it, and it's hilarious, because like, in that culture, in that time period, like that was considered sexual. And it's like really funny when you find out like the jokes were about people that didn't have the small. So it's like, oh, my God, Can you, just like, bro, it's been like, what, 2000 years. And just imagine like just the culture change, just shift. We don't realize like we've been living the way that we're living right now for what? A hundred years. OK, like a hundred years ago, this kind of life, this like, you know, um, comedy shows, clubs, entertainment theaters, movies, productions, cars, um, shopping, like shopping markets, all of these things. Past hundred years, bro. That's it. I mean, we're a little more than that, but yeah, we, we're <sighs> a on. blip, and, but we are a blip. Yeah. You're right. And the whole millennia of all of the history of the universe and everything. Like I give historic tours of, of Boston, uh, where I live. I'm not from Boston. I live here. I don't want people you don't to sound think, like oh, you're from Boston. the hat, the, the hat and the attitude makes sense. You're a Bostonian. I'm not even Irish. All right. <laughs> leave me alone. But <laughs> I, uh, I'm from Baltimore, which is not much better, but at least Baltimore has people of color anyway. Yeah. But, Ooh, yeah so I give historic true. tours of, of Boston <laughs> and I have to say, this is 150 years old. And then watch the people in Europe go, okay, 150 years old. That's it. Because so much of Europe is like hundreds of years old. And they're used to seeing really old stuff that have survived. Meanwhile, I'm like, hey, this is the first church in Boston. It was built in 1877. And they're like, that's not true at all, actually. But you no. know, this is the first piece of American architecture that was built in 1877, Trinity Church by Henry Hanson Richardson. None of that makes sense. Somebody's right now going to Google Trinity Church, Henry, rewind, Henry Hobson Richards, rewind again. Built by Henry Hobson Rich. It's like somebody's Googling this and rewinding back to try and catch what I said to try and fact check me. And I'll give you real facts. All right. I won't just give hypothetical things that I'm making up just for because they Bro, sound funny. Okay. This is a, like literally <laughs> if you are look, looking for facts, this is the wrong podcast. <laughs> this is a place. I don't, to I don't want somebody out, fact checking me in the comments. I don't want nah, like, nah. Uh, the first church in Boston was actually the King's Chapel Church. Demi, how good at your job of tourism is it that you didn't? know that like i'm already fearing the, the, did you the do section. a voiceover for ernie because you you sound like you do a very good ernie impression oh hey there no, yeah i do have friends who work for Sesame street maybe when that guy dies i'll i'll work my way into oh my Sesame God. street via my my connection i was gonna say connections but i got one i just know one person hey. who works for Sesame street i have worked with kenny cash though the guy who did elmo Oh, okay. Long before the accusations and and the and the, those things of of him grooming young teenage boys came out. Yeah, I hope I got that. 
allegation correct? No, I, I think you are. I, I think you're yeah. you're hitting it on the the nail. I remember. But I, I just, you know what's amazing about them? Honestly, again, there's there's talent and, and artistry right there. Is that? But here's the amazing thing. I watched it. Like, and this is not. He's not hiding behind a box. There's no stage. I was doing. Uh, I used to work for iHeartRadio, and every year we would do a radio thon raising money for St. Jude's or. We did two a year. One was St. Jude and one some other organization of dying kids with cancer. But so we had Elmo come out to entertain kids while we did this 48 hour straight radiothon. And it's amazing. A guy sitting there with a with a puppet. This is the true artistry right there. He has this puppet. He's looking the kids in the face. He's not interacting with the puppet. The puppet's interacting with the kids and the kids don't even see the guy. They talk to I'm like I, me as a adult when Elmo would talk to me, I would. He'd be talking to me through Elmo and I'd be looking right at Elmo and talking to Elmo. Like that's the artistry that they'd be able to create that connection with people where you don't see that it's fake. You don't see a man manipulating just some foam and fur. You see I, Elmo. I And it's funny because I, like I said earlier, like I grew up in the early 2000s and that's kind of how I felt as a kid, you know, like seeing Elmo and. That it was interesting see, to, see, see, that people saw you and not the man with his arm shoved up your ass. <laughs> no, because I, as a kid, knew that they were puppets. I was told that they were puppets. Like, I knew what I was looking at. Like, the thing was, is we didn't need to, I didn't need to know that it was 100% real. It just had to give a valuable message, you know, something that can you can connect to. And that's the type of artistry that I really loved. And... That's something I, again, like kind of tying into is like a thing that you find with comedy. Why do you think people love certain comics? Why do you think people love going to comedy shows? It's because of that connection. Well, I mean, there's so many subjective reasons that go. Oh, for sure. Like but that is like, one. And of, honestly, one, one of the things that boils down to is why do is that we like them because of our just dumb lizard brains find them, their faces to be symmetri symmetrical and that they're conventionally attractive. I mean, how many, I mean, you live in Florida. How many dumb ditzy blondes, uh, both male and female out there, think that everything they say is interesting because everyone just thinks, treats them like they're interesting because they're attractive. Attractive, I mean, I'm not going to throw shade at Matt Rife, but well, here's in... me throwing shade at Matt Rife. Let's be honest. He's popular because he's fucking pretty. He's a pretty looking dude. We all like him, male, female. He is what we want in a, an attractive person. He's got high cheekbones. His face... Is symmetrical on both sides. He's thin. He looks good. He has big, puffy, dick-sucking lips. Like, he is a man that looks attractive to both sex, no matter who and what you are. So, when he smiles at you through that camera, when he's doing his dumb little uh, TikTok crowd work bullshit, we're <clears> like, oh my god, this guy's funny. Like, because he looks appealing. We want him. We want to give this person reasons for us to like them. We want to we want to confirm our bias in our brain that we like this person because he is he makes us gives us a little little tingly tum, tingles in our little tummy tums. He makes <laughs> us feel good because he looks pretty. So well, we have to say he's funny too. And we have to say he's smart. I mean, look at go go th go through thought talk. Uh, those TikTok videos are women just like, oh my god, I love guys with a dad bod, and just look at all the dumb simps in the comment section going, oh my god, you're smart and brilliant. No, we're just. Dumb animals that like people well, because of the attractive they look. Now, granted, when it comes to ugly people, there's other attributes that we also uh, like. I mean, there's people that by bias, if you're a person of color, they're going to like you no matter what, whether they're the same color or a different color. You know, as soon as a black person walks on stage, there's certain people just going to go, everything he's going to say is going to, I mean, we do that bullshit tokenism I, to people of, I, of I, minorities, of this. ethnicities and all the time too. So it's like, there's a lot of factors that go I in know. besides just the actual quality and talent of it. Uh, I, I, that might've been a rant but from a short, fat, ugly no. looking bald dude with glasses. So I don't know, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe it was bitterness <laughs> and I'm not funny, or maybe uh, I just see the world differently uh, because- I've been told too many times that uh, uh, when a woman looks at me and just goes, ew, you know, so maybe I'm biased. <laughs> no, I, 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 I do. I, I do agree with you. And I grew up, I grew up in an interracial home. So my dad is African. My dad was from Morocco and my mom was third generation American coming from Polish and Hungarian ancestry. So 
this is going to sound like, oh my God, you know, so like enlightened. I never really saw the line of color because my mom is, my mom is white and my dad was not. So this whole idea of like black and white, you know, and like, it's fucking 2023, honey. Like the civil war was about over close to 60 years ago now. Wake up and grow up. Who fucking cares? It's like they're an Asian person. So take care of them just like you take care of anybody else. Yeah. Anybody I mean, else? Biases and, like, it's, it blows my mind how many biases we accept and how many we, we say are racist. Like, I was thinking about this the other, like, not historian going to tell what he thinks is understands a historic fact. Like, do you not understand why we, like, we attribute, like, it's, it, it, I think about this a lot here in Boston. That Boston gets this reputation of being aggressive drivers, and they're not. Oh, I don't know. Maybe things were different before it I moved here ten years ago. When it I moved here, like, literally, the people that at green lights, I, I've never been so mad at people for driving so slow in my entire life than since I moved to Boston. Right? I was just in Dallas for a whole week driving around. Didn't yell at anybody once out the car window. Right? I didn't yell one obscenity that I'm not going to say on this podcast, so it's on record in my car at anybody in Texas. Oh, you can but fucking curse in, on this in, podcast. In, in, you can was, say fuck, cunt, suck, puss, <laughs> shit. Everything. I know. Look, I know a trap when I see one. Anyway, I, I, uh, and trust me, everything I say is worse than what you just said. But I, I, I had a zip card the other day and I screamed, which, by the way, let's talk about for a second. Every the amount of rental cars I've gotten into where the vents are pushed towards the windows, the hot, the heat temperature is raised all the way up and the air conditioner button is still on means that everyone else is the problem, not me. But here we go. The amount this of times like, the, the green lights and I. We we can attribute this to people being on the phone. Light turns green. They're still doing on their phone. Oh, I got to go. I got to drive now. No, they're just slow here. Every single one. People turn off their car at green lights here. I like, down. I know cars have an automated thing that shuts their engine off to save uh-huh. gas or whatever, but you know, that is a really saving gas. It's like that adage. What costs yeah. more electricity leaving the light on or turning it on and off? All the time? <laughs> anyway, but here's well, the point. No, is that, I literally was at a green yeah. light. I honked at the car in front of me because oh they didn't move. And I yelled, oh green means go, asshole. And this person from Boston turned out the window and went, I can't speak to other people's experiences. I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. Go. They, they, they stop at green lights, right? If you're driving straight, people will stop at a green light and let the traffic, oncoming traffic, turn left in front of them. There is nothing less aggressive driving than giving up your right away, which they do here all the fucking time. It drives me absolute bonk shit. But the reason why Boston has this stereotype of being aggressive drivers is because they have here in their highways something that they don't have anywhere else in the country, and it's called active and unactive breakdown lane. What does that mean? It's a fucking shoulder. They have a shoulder during certain parts of the day, and other parts of the day you can drive on the shoulder. So you get a bunch of no nuts, no nothings, nutheads coming up here, and they're driving on the highways, and then all of a sudden a Bostonian drives down the shoulder because that shoulder is now an active driving lane. And you're like, oh my God, the people here drive so aggressively, they'll drive around you on the shoulders. That's where it comes from. That and like we have to think about them. Oh, they're these tough little Irish. No, they're xenophobic, racist, white trash people who <laughs> ate potatoes and almost died because they ran out of them. Oh my god. That run a city and they they are so stubborn and stupid to cut the nose to spite their face. They make a city scape that is just mind boggly stupid and then like, oh, it becomes from all the cow pastures here. No, there's not. There's no cow paths here. <laughs> Your city's also been remade since those cow paths. Oh my God. Right? I, yeah. Anyway, but I I'm sorry. no, but dude. These stereotypes come from like ah, they're so s- tough. They must be aggressive drivers because they're tough and they're mean. And if I uh, don't let them turn left in front of me, they'll get out of their car and beat me with a shillelagh. <laughs> no, it, it's a. You're, I, just, I will t- you're just from a part of the world that didn't have people of color move to another place where there's nothing but white people, and you're aggressively <laughs> scared because of it. I, I will tell you this, dude. I live like down here in South Florida. I live in uh, Fort Lauderdale. God's waiting room. Okay. How do I put this? So we have snowbirds, which first off, mm-hmm. Canadians, go back to your country. 
<laughs> go back to Canada. Please. Time out, time out. For, those who are not listening, for those who are not watching the podcast and listening only, I just want you to know the guy who is half white, half black was just yelling at other people to go back to their country. Not the guy who looks like a January 6th recreationist. <sighs> okay. Let me explain to you. Okay. And like nothing against Canadians. You come down to Florida. You drive 20 miles under the speed limit in the middle fucking lane. Well, that's because they can't do the mathematic conversion from kilometers per hour to miles per hour. (laughs) And then the worst part is they don't understand that we have our left lane is not a shoulder lane. So the way that it is in Florida on the highways, left is the go lane. So people that are going like 10, 20 miles middle lane is people that might need to go right or left to turn off. And then, you know, right lane is whatever they will go on the left lane and they'll just keep on uh, break, uh, break, uh, break. uh." And it's gotten so bad. I, I saw this the other day. They have now the police patrol. They get on the highways two of them they go in between them and they pull them off i saw this twice in the past week it's <laughs> just so fucking bad and i'm like but, but how do you know that the uh, just out of curiosity how do you know these people are canadians and not just old people who drive back when you pass by them are they just chugging maple syrup and eating maple no, they leaves? have they have quebec they have their canadian quebec, license, oh, plates. license plates okay yeah and a lot so they're of driving down from canada yeah, and you, by the way, Ooh. you mentioned this earlier, which is a I good don't point. I from Boston to Florida. Ugh, that sounds like a terrible drive. <laughs> the, Just um, rent a car. Fly the, and rent a car. <laughs> Come on, Canada. You got planes, right? Those are the big silvery things that look like the geese that keep coming down to my state and shitting everywhere. Oh, my God. Well, it, so honestly, the problem is two things which people don't understand is canadian drivers generally drive in kilometers which you mentioned so they're not used to driving a lot of the times in miles because these people only come down for a few months every year the other big issue that causes this canadian highways and roads are very different here in the states so out there they have middle lanes that are purposely there to be slow and out there they have shoulder lanes they're used to turning left for exits, not the other way around on the right side. So that's why they keep on short stopping because they think it's on the left side and not the right. And of course, you're right. It's also because it's also elderly people. But there's like <laughs> a realistic answer for this craziness. You know, like you mentioned, like the reason why people think Massachusetts or ever, like especially people from Boston drive crazy. And it's just. Oh. That's why. Oh, I thought like it would be like, you know, a little like cooler, you know? Well, yeah, I the other it- like the other thing, like <laughs> the, the other thing, like everything we we talk about stereotype wise comes from a reason for that, whether they're right, right or wrong, whether they're racist or not. But like the the old adage, oh, he's got a big nose. He's got a big schmeckula, right? Like the reason that comes from anti-Semitism, right? They the the, the Romans created stereotypes about the jews and this is uh that oh all the jews have big noses which means they have big dicks which means they're gonna come here and rape all you italian women look out for the spooky jews and their big nose and big dicks they're gonna skip right we've moved past that stereotype so the, the the that the big dicks were scary because we in a society now think that you know it's pleasurable the same thing of mandingoing uh, black people comes from that very stereotype. Ter- like we would try to dehumanize people of color, African Americans uh, that were were here. <clears throat> we would dehumanize them by making them monstrous animal sex machines and look out for them and their big scary cocks, women. Ooh. You, you, um, but of course, fun. now we've like tried to reverse that, and now we're like, oh, big dicks are great, which I'm sure they're fine. What? I don't know. Nobody said. Nobody that I I I have. Nobody tells me. Uh, that's a lie. I was with a, 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 I was having sex with a stripper in the you know back room one day, and she goes, nice. "Oh my god, you're the biggest I've ever had." And I'm like, "I'm paying you not for your acting skills. You don't have to lie to me, right? <laughs> this is we're already on the set. We're, this is a transactional situation, right? I'm not a casting director. You don't have to lie to me." I was going to tell you the um, history fact actually that I checked up. Do you know that a lot of the people here in the states that are part of the black community. They're not African. Oh yeah, they're Caribbean. I mean, they're 
yeah, I'm sure if we chase back their lineage, but it's really difficult to check that their lineage because no, we erased sure. all of it. I know, literally, but it's also we didn't keep track of it, so there's actually nothing to erase. <laughs> and, and it's you know it's very odd because like I'm Jewish, and one of the things that was very beneficial for our family, I'm able to trace my lineage about almost two thousand years. And wow, see, I, and, and, and that's great that you can do that. Yeah, it's unfortunate how many people in can't this country do can't do that because yeah. they were never kept records of it. And it's just like there's so much, there's so much that you can learn from the past. You know, like as artists, there's so much I can learn from other artists and creators. Like even though it's 30, 50, 60, whatever years old, there's always something to learn. And something that you can implement and make it your own. You know, it's it's your it's your thing. It's your schmutz. Yeah, I mean, well, well that's it brings up the conversation of AI. <clears throat> We're talking about uh AI learning is it's stealing artists' work because it's reviewing artists' stuff and then recreating it with it with that in mind when it creates its thing. It's like, well, <clears throat> I mean, we've been doing that for ever like you can see tons of other people's work that came before them in current work like i mean the big joke is how much of quentin tarantino's work is literally inspired by francis ford coppola and the godfather guys that that you know and uh i love his wine i love francis coppola's wine oh my god it's amazing yeah Yeah. but such an awesome dude how much of his work is derivative of other people so is Quentin Tarantino thief. Some people say yes. Some people say no. Inspiration. Uh, look, it's, I'm not. AI is not coming after. AI is not going to be taking over my job anytime soon. I'm not worried about it. I should right? hope but not. But at the same time, I think it should be a tool that we can use to help yeah. increase our work. Dude, you guys have been working at looking at AI for decades and you don't even know it. Toy Story was made with AI. Right? Mm-hmm. Toy Story does keyframes and then they have a computer program that connects the keyframes for them and does the rest of the keyframe drawing. Well, they That's been happening to... for years with Toy Story's movies and it still works. It can be used as a tool and, and won't well, replace they talked, people. But... Interesting to bring this up. They talked, one of my favorite ones was Finding Nemo and they created a computer simu- simulator that you to artificial intelligence that mimic the shadows of the ocean. So if you watch it, you can you can see the shadows move, and it's like nobody sat there for ten like ten fucking months doing frame by frame. They had people there for weeks putting together this program that created that simulation, and it's like mm-hmm. this has been what twenty years, man. It's not by like way, it I, as a came SAG out of after, as a SAG after member, I'm so sick. During this, this right now we're in the middle of v- members are voting yes or no <clears throat> on their agreed upon contract with the AMPTP producers and stuff. And the entire time during the strike, I don't know if you watch Family Guy, but there's an episode of Family Guy where Lois runs for mayor. And every every debate, every speech is just her going 9-11. And then everyone cheers. It's the same thing with Fran Dresser, who's the leader of the SAG after union. But instead of 9 11, she's just going down and saying, AI, we're fighting against AI. I'm like, no, we're not. That's, they're like, they want to scan your bodies and put it in AI. I'm like, that's not how AI works. And also, we voted that down in the last contract negotiation. So why is it back on the table again? I know. Right? They've been talking about for years. They can already scan your body, put it in and do whatever they want with your body, right? We voted that shit down on the last contract negotiation. So why is it a staple part of this? And why are we calling it AI? Scanning your body into a computer is not artificial intelligence. They're not scanning your brain into a computer and making a new person out of it. That's what AI is. AI is scanning you and your brain functions and looking through your... I mean, the movie, the whole new Netflix series, House of Usher, talks about AI of taking your social media profiles and then scanning into the computer and then making new person out of your social media profiles. We well, struck this down. The, 
Fran Dresser is just using this bullshit to try and bolster her positioning in the SAG after for the next fucking election. So we're all like, oh my God, the, the nanny, she was a Sarah Connor and saved us from the robots. No, she didn't. Well, she's one taking thing- away your health care is what she's doing. Actors. <laughs> One thing that I uh, I know it's a TV show, but like when you look at Star Trek, one thing that you notice is like nobody has there's no cell phones, you know, and it, Bullshit. It, it, communicators. They had the two way. They, they had, had communicators. Those... But the interesting thing is how they interacted. Enterprise. <laughs> the, the way they interacted with computers. The way that they interacted with computers was was commands. They would speak, mm-hmm. and you're like, wait a minute. So that means that they had... And then later on in the series, you start to learn... I think it was um, when they had the space station, you learn that there's they have communications that interact with their suits. So you can have astronauts have safer equipment when they're traveling in space or in long periods in certain... This is all using artificial intelligence. If you really look at Star Trek, there's no way on earth any of that is not artificial intelligence. And yeah. yes, it's a TV show, and yes, it's not real, but look what we could potentially create using artificial intelligence. We can explore other worlds. We can learn more about our seas underground. We can learn more about people. We can learn how to, instead of fucking popping pills in people's mouths, figure out other ways to better people's lives. I mean, unless the pills you're popping is to prevent the bends when you go deep down into the Mariana Trench. Right. But yeah, correct. (laughs) It's just just a perspective. I, I think that there are a lot of negatives when it comes to the but there's a lot of benefits that can be used even for comics i believe that artificial intelligence could be very beneficial yeah i mean we were literally just talking i was at a comedy festival in plano texas a couple weeks ago one of the things we were talking about uh during a workshop of how to punch up your jokes how to make your jokes better whatever this guy whatever bullshit this guy was selling uh one of the things he did bring up was a good topic is that when uh part of joke writing is is creating here's two juxtaposition things well, we write a list of things associated with this side of it and then write a list of things that are associated with this side of it. I should probably, professional radio personality should, A, stop scratching his nose while he's talking on camera. <laughs> but also, you, when I'm using my hands for demonstration versus putting it in front of the mic, between the mic and the camera, instead of behind the microphone. Can you see my hand? All right, anyway. Hi. <laughs> Go back to, if you have not watched the visual part, if you're still listening audio, come watch this. See my fat, dumb face and, and my big, dumb, stumpy fingers as I make visual aids. But one of the things we we're talking about is Love you have it. two juxtaposition things, you know, topic A and topic B, and you want to have them related in a in a, a way that is not commonly associated with them. Well, write a list of things associated with this thing and then write a list associated with, with uh, thing B, and then look to see how you can compare the two. And one of the things he said is that that's a great purpose for AI right now. AI, I don't, you know, chat GPT, write me a list of things involving uh, waiters and restaurants. And then also chat chat GPT, write me a list of things that are associated with the doctor's office. And then you can look at these two lists associated with with the two of them and figure out where the comedy is. Where is the thing that is, uh, what part of part A connects to part B? Where is this thing that, if you're talking about part A, you want to relate it to something on the list of B and artificial intelligence is a good resource for that. Apparently. I don't know. I don't, I haven't used any of it. <laughs> well, it, it is kind of right now in early stages, you know, it, it, there is a lot of advancements that need to take place for it to be better, but you do bring up a good point. It can help the structure of joke writing. I mean, you're still writing it down. It's still your work. But you're using a program to help better suit where, you know. I mean, you're uh, a musician. How many times have you opened a rhyming dictionary? As an example, when you're writing lyrics, right? If you want to write a, a, a lyrics that rhyme, where's the best resource for it? Sitting around going, apple, bapple, crapple, dapple, apple, feple, geppel, 
Lapple, maple. No, you go to a rhyming dictionary and you put in the word that you want to rhyme with. And you're like, all right, what worms rhyme with this? Chat GPT, essentially for like comparison list, not that much different. Yeah, that's actually what I did. <laughs> oh, you feel so called out right now. That's why you're being no, silent. No, no, no. I you're don't feel You're giving me a silent death stare of daggers. And you're just like, look, that was my secret. Rhyming dictionary was my secret. How did you figure it out? Are you in Are you in my closet when I'm writing music? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I did, uh, I traditionally had a like standard intro for the podcast and I didn't like it. I wanted like a jingle, you know, I kind of wanted it to like, take it back to kind of like, you know, the radio days. So I created a, a 30 second jingle for the intro. And then what I did was I, I kind of like put it together and then I used chat GPT to figure out like the other words. And it's a very simple, just one sentence that fit it was amazing. It was just a, a simple one sentence that fit exactly in 30 seconds. So. Yeah, I mean, it's not bad for copywriting, apparently. Sometimes no. when I just have to write dumb copy, I'm just sitting there staring at the screen, watching the cursor blank, and it's just like, it's two sentences, Dennis. It's just figure it out. And, you know, sometimes sometimes that's all you need. Like, uh, one, one song that I fucking love from the Ramones is I Want to Be Sedated. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it, the song is... Oh, you like that one really super popular song from the Ramones? Great. No, there's other ones. There's also <laughs> there's also Cement I'm teasing, Jungle. I'm teasing. But the, the thing is, giving that as an example, hey, because hey, that song is... my baby away? Uh, <laughs> don't get me started, bro. I have a fucking... I have it on vinyl record. I'll put it on. <laughs> Can, is that what this podcast can be? Just us getting in the groove of listening to Ramon songs? I, I, I mean, we we could do that, but there is copyright issues, and <laughs> I think Mickey Ramon is still alive, so I don't want to mess with that guy. I mean, but um, <laughs> CJ Ramon's still alive, but I don't think he has any. Uh, he's still touring, but I don't think he has any legal no. pull. <laughs> I think it would only be no Mickey offense, CJ. I have friends who are uh, my friend. Friend of mine is CJ's drummer, so. I uh, shouldn't be throwing shade. He's not, no, he's... My friend's not going to listen to this podcast. He's too busy running around the yard, enjoying his uh, with his son and enjoying a happy life with his attractive wife and his uh, son and not having to worry about the struggles of, oh, you know, putting gas in the car to be able to get from tour spot to tour spot. Yeah. I'm not sure that's... he doesn't have to worry about that with his <laughs> other band. That's not CJ Ramon. Oh, now I'm, I'm just de- degrading down to plugging my friends' works. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> just like, hey, go to deadardennis.com and listening and watch some of my videos and listen and follow me on social media. Instead of doing that, yeah. I'm plugging my other f- friends' stuff. No, that's cool, bro. But like, uh, what was what I was trying to say was in that song you have like what two, three sentences maybe, and yeah it's like it's so fucking catchy like i you put on that song and i could probably sing it with a crowd of 100 people probably you can do yeah, that you can sing the song cfg yeah it's i love it, it yeah it it's like, there's a reason why it's the basic it's, uh, the 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 basis of the music why, it, there's a re- some reason why it all the all the notes start at c i don't know why they didn't have to make it and start in the middle of the alphabet they could start at the beginning of the alphabet but they did it they started in the middle well, the middle, the most pleasing, so I guess. starting with, for example, on a guitar, if you started with an A minor, so A minor is quite low. So usually a C is, you can start at a higher pitch. So you can go, for example, like yeah, 100 and, we could, 120. Instead of, starting, instead of labeling it C, we could have labeled it A. And it could have just gone A, B, C, D, E, F, G, G, E. Well, yeah, I don't. I can't. I don't know my alphabet. Well, no, no, <laughs> I mean, there, there's a reason. There's no there's a reason, reason why, why they started in the middle. Yeah. I mean, if there is, then please explain. It no, to but me. I was but just like, yeah, we can just start with the beginning. Usually, yeah. For example, like a C minor is one of the type of chords that you can start. You can do at a very high tempo. So, being that said, a lot of rock bands, specifically punk bands, usually C or C or D, we're talking about specifically on a guitar or electric guitar, would be those type of keys or an F would be the ones that you type it. And the interesting thing is, like you said, it's just two, maybe three chords, sometimes four, 
tops five sentences and it's like a rhythmic beat, you know, kind of touching where like you have the, the joke and the punchline. So you have the beat and the lyric, beat lyric, lyric beat. And it's just, that's, that's all it is. That's like, that's what rock and punk is. So, but it has that complexity, bro. Cause like anybody can fucking do that in their garage, like in their grandma's yeah. garage, you know, but it's got to work, you know, it, it's got to come together in a way. Yeah. But that I was still my... just don't know why we didn't start note the, 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 the music scale in the middle uh, at the beginning with the letter A, but that's just for me, but. <laughs> well, it has to, so here, my guitar is a little fucked up. So this is a uh, high E. This is an A. So this mm -hmm. is the A chord. This is a D. Yep. This is a G, and then G. there's a B, and then a low and E a. that's supposed to be there. So the reason why is if we start from the top, from here, this would be an F. Oh, I mean, I, I also play music. I understand how the scale works. No, no, no. But what I'm trying to say, like, the reason, like, also, honestly, I've seen songs that start with an A, but you generally see that with, it's beautiful. Oh, my God. Like, mm -hmm. the Spanish um, acoustic guitarist. And they do that, like, the, the finger Flamingo picking. Fingers, like, yeah. Oh, my God. It, dude, it's I could just sit there and just have a fucking orgasm. It's Dude, awesome. The, uh, growing up, uh, the alternative rock station in, uh, that I listened to growing up, WHFS, one day flipped to uh, Spanish music. And uh, you know what? I killed me that they took away my favorite music radio station. But also, at the same time, my clock radio was still set to it. And you know what? Mariachi bands is the best music to wake up to. <laughs> But it just starts playing. You're like, oh, my God, I'm going to have a bed dancing. I, don't, I, don't, I almost don't care that they <laughs> fired all of my friends. I almost don't care about that. <laughs> uh, I love um, I, I just I love that, like, creative flow. I love getting into that process of, like, I want to make something, you know, like when you probably get into that, like, flow, of, like I'm, I want to work on a joke. I want to, you know, kind of work on this bit and put it together. To me, that is like my fucking testosterone. That's like my heroin. Yeah, I mean, I, we all have, not we all, some of us just have a need to create. Sometimes you have to go out and create those things. You know, I the reason mm -hmm. I started doing comedy seriously is because I felt that I had no creativity at the job I was at in radio. I wasn't being taken serious uh, as someone who wanted to be on air. Wasn't really being given the opportunity. So I decided to take my own creativity, my own entertainment career into my hands and start doing stand-up because no one can stop me from doing stand-up, right? Fuck you people who are like, oh, there's cancel culture. Cancel culture <laughs> doesn't exist. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> anyway, there's consequence culture. Anyway, that's it's called woke culture. But right, it, yeah, yeah. Tell, me, tell me, point out to me one person who's been properly canceled. And I'll show you somebody who is probably a pederast. Chris Dilley. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> you know, I went out and I decided I want to be able to create things. Nobody can stop me. Mm. Right. I can go on. I, I, you, you don't want me on your show. That's fine. I'll create a show. Or there's plenty of people that will give me stage time to be able to go out there and, and tell my funnies and my, my stories and going out there and entertaining people. I like right? dirty you can't comics. Stop me from doing that, you know? All I, like, I need yeah. is my voice. And even out there, for those who can't speak, deaf people, they go out and they do jokes. I'm sure there's somebody. You know, I've definitely oh, seen people who are, oh my God, who are it's so funny. going out and doing comedy. They do it with signs or they have, work with a person that translates for them, right? I've seen comedians doing, I've seen sign language comedians, they exist. Right. And even on top of all that, even if you can't go out into the world, like there are so many places, unfortunately, that are not handicap accessible that does comedy. Right. And I generally don't think about it until I, a couple of years ago, I met a friend who is wheelchair bound and she literally can't get into that most comedy clubs because they, they have stairs. But 
I mean, I complain, oh, I'm old and my knees are bad and there's no elevator for me to walk down up. The, I got to walk upstairs with my bad knees that are shot from ducking bullets going over my head the entire time I lived in Baltimore for 31 years. Oh, boo-hoo me. But there are people who legitimately can't get into places. She can't even go enjoy comedy, let alone do comedy. She can't get on the goddamn fucking stage and it's a travesty. But tragedy, not travesty, two different things. Sorry. Yes, apologies. indeed. Anyway, but, Good corrective so, grammar. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I uh it's 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 tragic that she has that she's literally limited to being able to go out and do comedy. But there's things like Zoom comedy, which people should still support. But whatever. I mean, well, it's not the same. You, Shut up. You know, it, there was um me, there's a it's, it, it's there even if you can't get out of your house, you can create animations, you can create videos. There's so many ways of yeah. you going out and be able to expel your energy as being a creative person and doing that out there and it's great that we have all these options now sorry you were saying what was I was gonna gonna t- t- let me get down from my soapbox <laughs> i was gonna i was gonna tell you that uh a lot of people don't know this you know fox uh fox news and fox in general they have a, a voiceover actor that does a lot of their like broadcasting mm-hmm. he's blind he doesn't <laughs> see and he does like videos and it's a he's shame also because they can't see the bullshit that fox news is putting on the air all the time <laughs> but he uh he does other like broadcasts or like game shows and different things like that but like he also One is thing a... he's not he's doing play-by-play sports but <laughs> yeah there's the setup and the punchline the setup and the hey! the guy who's blind is working in voiceover the expectation between that is like yeah but he can't do sports by there's me screwing up again but he video, actually but... is a professional uh surfer he surfs blind oh wow yeah, and I was like, so not only is I can't this wait go- for the Fox headline: "Blind Surfer Eaten by <laughs> Shark." <laughs> um, but it, that was something that it kind of like not only didn't like inspire me, but got me thinking. Wow, like this guy is artistic. He wants to be artistic. He can't see, but he's figured out a way of like doing the things that he loves with his limitations. Yeah, I. During club during the days of the pandemic, when I was in Clubhouse a lot, I was talking to a, did a couple clubhouses with a guy who's also blind and a voiceover artist, and I had to ask him, "How do you get your scripts? Braille? Does somebody read it back to you and just repeat it? Like, how does that work? You know?" And and it's there's you know he has you have to figure it out somehow. There's if there's a will, there's a way. You know, we'll we'll get you out there. We'll get you what you need to do what you want to do. I mean, it'd be nice if these things were more accessible, but it's great that there's people that have that uh, inspired to go out and do things and they have to find a way to do it, whether you want to do it or not. I mean, I guess that's what AGT is always looking for. They're looking for that. What held you back? And you can have your sob story of like, Oh, my dad died and he never believed in me. And he always wanted me to be a comedian. And now dad's watching me tell jokes from having fuck you. No, yeah, it, it it's not it's not that simple. You know, every look, everybody has a good story to a certain yeah. extent. And it's what you want to bring out to the world. What I what I think is what makes a great comedian is a comedian that knows they're a comedian. Knows how to how to work oh, and continue to grow. I want to open mics because you're gonna get at least three people every night going. Be a yeah, but bro, like, listen, man, those fuckers, you got those people. Shut up. Shut the fuck up, bro. Like, nobody <laughs> wants to hear that shit. Nobody. Nobody I wants to hear jokes. that. This is my therapy. Get a better HMO. You're better off with the PPO. <laughs> but I feel you. Man. So how long have you been doing this? How long have you been a comic? How many years? Uh, I say 13 years now. Cause I think that's what it is. I don't know. At some point I stopped counting and just every so often I, uh, I tack on a year ago. I'm sure it's probably been another year. <clears throat> Although I think I'm actually correct in that number just because of like Facebook memories and stuff. I, uh, I mean, before that though, I was, you know, workshopping with friends and I would do an open mic once or twice a year, once every other year, some stupid shit like that, but I wasn't really doing comedy. Then when I was on radio, everything I said was either, informative or a joke. So I was joke writing then. And I did sketch comedy TV show when I was in college. So, I mean, you know, I I did improv in high school. Like we had a real, actually legitimate theater program and a legitimate improv troupe. 
So, you know, it's easy to say that I've been doing comedy my entire life, but for, seriously, for real, taking it serious and doing it regularly and making a career out of it, finger quotes set from the guy who, uh, <laughs> you know, had 18 months of full-time <laughs> comedy, acting, entertainment, living expenses being paid by, by the entertainment industry. And then the pandemic hit. So I say 13 years. And I know you didn't need all that backstory. And no, 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 it's good. It's good. Exposition. No. Expedition is a car made by Ford. It's not a great car, but <laughs> it's funny. Cause I own a Ford product, but yeah. oh, you, you own a found on road dead. No, I I own a uh, I own a Ford Mustang. I have a 2011 Ford Mustang convertible. Dude, I drove the Ford. I drove the electric Ford Mustang E, the mm-hmm. electric version of it. It's a nice car. It is. It's got pickup. It goes. It's got 240 some miles to a battery. Oh, nice! But it also takes 12 hours to charge. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's not that's not fun. I look like I my mine is naturally aspirated. And it's okay that it's polluting the air because I, I like I like the vroom vroom. It's good. Oh, this thing's got it doesn't have the vroom, but it's got the go. Like I meant to do a video <laughs> of me trying to peel wheels in a parking lot with this Mustang oh rental, and I just never got around to doing it. <laughs> but I would love to be able to just like, well, that's a hard part. You can't rev the engine. You can't be like, there's no real gears where it's like. Drop it in neutral and, rah, 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 and then drop it in drive. It doesn't really work that way. I no, mean, it does, yeah. But it doesn't. No. There's no like revving the engine in neutral. No. It's just. But you step on that gas and it, it'll it ah, give you that, that, that pullback. Your hair will go back a little bit. You get a little whiplash <sighs> if, you, if you stomp on that gas pedal a little fast. It's a different kind of like fling. It like is. You, like it doesn't have that like. You know when you're like in a car and you floor it and it kind of drops back a little bit and then throws your head back like you feel the <laughs> car just drop down a little bit and frrr, like the front end comes up and the back end goes down you're like oh it doesn't have that drop it just goes whoop, you just go straight laterally back in an electric mustang it's different but it's uh it was nice i liked it if i had the money for it i would and, and if charging was ubiquitous as gas stations are i would one thousand percent get a mustang e I that that's kind of the thing for me with like electric cars. I'm 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 still stuck in that era of like still sticking with gas. Uh like you were saying, I love oh my god, dude, that feeling of being in a car and just putting my foot on the gas and mine's rear wheel drive. So you just like you go mm-hmm. Yeah. Little, little bump when you feel the automatic transmission change. I have an automatic. I wish it was a manual, but it still has that little click. It it's so funny because the car, in a way, is kind of like a 1960s car. This is the kind of thing with Ford. I kind of feel like they're like, how do we make a car that will pass all of the emissions, but we don't have to do fucking anything? You know, instead of just like putting pieces over it, making it look, you know, kind of kind of modern. That's kind of what an S one one ninety seven is. Okay, let's just be honest. Like that, that it's a nineteen sixties car, and it drives like one too. So when you turn, you, you mean pray to power the Lord. Steering? <laughs> Dude, is you it pray just to a the giant Lord? boat that you can't. <sighs> oh my god! Yeah, it's like a boat. It literally is like a boat trying to turn it. Like you feel like what everybody felt like in nineteen sixty five. They're pain. They're pain. <laughs> The, the, just who goes to the gym when you got a car without power steering? It has power steering. Do it, it's yeah. the worst power steering I've ever seen in any car. <laughs> it's just a word with quotations, you know. Power steering. Power steering. Yeah, arm powered. <laughs> God, you only get like I have to like press the gas to actually get it to move. <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't turn. This reminds me of a lot of type of people. Besides, you know, it's a car, but this reminds me of like a lot of type of people. You know, where you gotta, gotta coax really... them into things. Yeah, <laughs> it's pull. It, it, it feels like you're pulling teeth sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Driving Just... this car is like pulling teeth. <laughs> They're I love it though. The roots. <laughs> I love it though. I, I I know it sounds crazy, but like it really it. It makes you, 
it makes you feel more connected to the road. Like, I, I can't, I cannot sit on my phone texting in this car. It's just not, it's not happening. Yeah, yeah, you have to be, yeah, you have to pay attention to what you're doing, which I wish more people were paying attention to what they're doing in their cars, though. But not everyone feels as connected to the road as you do. <laughs> but I always think about that, too. Like, when I do, like, when I fantasize about doing actual real road trips, like, I'm, I'm uh, if I say this on the recording, it's got to happen now. All right, let's do this. You have to do it in a VW plan, camper. I'm planning on doing like a two month road trip. VW uh, camper, one hundred percent. Me and my dog. I'm gonna go. We're we're driving down to Baltimore to be, spend the holidays with my family. I'm gonna buy a car, and then drive west to LA, spend a month out there, and drive back to Boston and start my job back up in March. That's the plan. I don't know if the plan's going to work out. Like looking at the the financial pieces of this plan don't seem as viable as it did when it was a fantasy dream in, in July. But uh, every time I, I do road trips, I do real road trips, you know, and tours and going to other cities and states and, you know, doing comedy stuff. I always think about that. I want to do that drive. Like I want to live that road life. I want to create a road blog, you know, like, driving around from city city, looking at the cityscapes and editing videos and doing interviews and, and doing touristy things and videotaping it and putting it all on YouTube and creating a travel blog of a comedian's life. But that time you're in the car is a waste of time. Can't film in a car. I mean, you can probably, you can film a little bit, do a couple of like heads up things, film a couple of things that you see by, but can't edit in a car. You can't really write script. You know, you can say things out loud, rehearse it, put in, but you need that other person, somebody else driving, somebody else to take notation. And my dog, no matter how many milk bones I give her, my dog, who is named Sister, still hasn't figured out how to do transcription. I don't know what her holdup is, but she keeps saying, I don't have opposable phones I mean, and I you, don't speak English. And I you're mean, high you on mushrooms when you're hearing me respond to you. But you, know, the, you, uh, could, you, you could teach her how to drive, you know, so yeah, she can right. take care of that. She's, oh, she's a lab. She can't reach the pedals, but the, uh, <laughs> she's got the steering down. It's just, she can't reach the pedals. No. But yeah, it's like, so it's like th that, that you're right. That's not wasted time creatively, but it's also like, you can't, you, you have to focus on what you're doing. You can't really split, split your brain off for six to eight hours a day while you're driving. <laughs> it's. It's it's really important that you bring this up because when we when we make big life decisions and when a lot of the times, you know, you get those little clickbaits, you get those like one minute of like, here's my life. This is what I'm doing. Yada, yada. Come you with me as we check out this <laughs> incredibly popular tourist thing that you found on Google. But you don't see the whole picture. Yeah. You don't see the. 10 hour drive, the traffic, the gas, the stopping for food, you know, the, the time that you may have to go to a hotel cause you just can't fucking keep your eyes open. I, th there's just so many things that happens to make that one minute clip. Yeah. So I'm going to don't even realize how much goes into it. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you specifically, the guys of the, uh, uh, what's it? Jason Bateman and the, the smartless podcast guys. I'm looking at you guys. Oh, podcasting easy. Yeah. It's super easy when you have a staff of five people doing all the work for you. Nobody else in the world knows how much work goes into making a podcast. No, I'm doing the work. There's, of there's little people. work. You think there's no work that goes into it by the amount of people that have podcasts. There's a lot of work that goes into all of this that we don't see in the background. At least, you know, some people, some people put more effort in than others. For sure. It's just like, uh, it's just like when you, when I'm watching these clips of comedians and these bits that they're doing, sorry, I, I know we're over an hour. Um, it's just really cool because I know some of these artists that are not as big as others. They probably like went through the 60 minute or, you know, 30 minute or 15 minute or what, whatever set that they did and found that piece, you know, edited it together and then posted it. 
how to, and like I can relate to it because I do that with my podcast. You know, yeah, you're looking for through, that, that that tiny little clip to get somebody interested into it. And correct. Then you, you pour over every syllable as you're editing through through it. I mean, it also goes into you know what it's what we do as comedians on stage. You don't understand the years that we put into creating a persona, creating writing, creating material, workshopping it over and over. It seems effortlessly funny and that we just created it in the moment, but we've spent days, weeks, months er, you're working on over this thing to make this one 45 second speech hilarious. Not even on social media. This one thing face to face that I said to you, like the, the amount of times like I do all, you know, we have our all set lines that all look, you know, crowd worky and you know on my tours when i'm a, I'm a tour guide here in boston for boston duck tours and uh, i ask kids questions you know as they come up to drive the little duck boat in the in the, in the river in the charles river and i ask them oh what's your favorite subject in school math math was my favorite subject that's why i'm here being a history guy <laughs> like you know like oh my god that was so funny how did you know because i've asked 1200 kids the same question and I finally found the line that worked. So I've said it 1,200 more times. And I'm going to say it 1,200 more times again and over and over because it worked. Oh, but it seems so natural. That was uh, – I, this is – But you don't so- know the hours that went into asking kids questions and getting shit replies are like, oh, what am I going to work with here, kid? You got to say something. <laughs> you you, you got to say something interesting so I can say something funny. Come on, kid. Uh, this is so random. I don't know why this reminds me of this. Is Monk? You ever? Oh, ever? Tony yeah. Shalhoub. No, I love that Oh my show. God, he's so fucking good. And Tony Shalhoub and the guy who played Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs. His boss. Uh, what's his? I, I know the actor. I would fuck me. I would fuck me. That guy. <laughs> that's his boss. <laughs> It, the um, guy who tucked his penis in a movie between his legs is <laughs> Monk on USA's boss. <laughs> it's a good show. You Film know, the, the thing that I what I was like interesting about this show is like after like watching episode after episode is that all he's doing is is just asking the same questions over and over and over again, and then seeing the different responses, and then using the better response to get a better answer and then uses that over and over and just does the same things. And it's like, oh my God, that's fucking genius. Yeah. Looking for the differences. Yeah, yeah. bro. I don't know. I don't know why it's like so stupid not to like realize that in a matter of a second. Why to like fucking take so long to realize that it's like, just ask the right questions. Like, what are the I right mean, questions? You know, trust me. There's, there, it, it, when it comes to interviews, writing, asking what the right question is is tough enough for people to do interviews every day. I'm looking at you, local morning TV shows, and like, oh, where did you? Da, da, da. Anyway, sorry. No, they're reading off a, a top. I have a lot of a, a, a lot of uh, beefs with people that are only in my own head. <laughs> Hello, America. Welcome to Sunday Morning's News. <laughs> it's so fun. It's so fun. We're not reading off a teleprompter. We promise. Mm-hmm. I'm not looking at a screen. I'm looking directly at you. Hi, I'm just an attractive person reading to you out loud. <laughs> <laughs> now here's advertising. Oh, my God. For Mija, take control of your life. <laughs> always for so, make everything better oh my god yes always <laughs> yeah i mean i'm fat i'm overweight i have heart condition and diabetes now and they want to give me ozempic they want to give me give me bulimia in a pill to just to make me just oh, to make me oh, oh, not, live ozempic. Longer. oh, oh ze- uh. <laughs> Oh, you've so probably does. done a bit about this. I feel like you've 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 figured out like a little I'm in the middle of writing it. Yeah, you called me out on my bullshit. Sorry, I just opened mic. Yeah, I opened mic. Yeah, I opened mic. You in conversation. Oh I did God. that. I'm sorry. I'm that asshole. <laughs> I just did that. Sorry. I was literally laying in bed. I wrote that last night. <sighs> Dreaming about it. You know, it's just like I need it. I need it. I showed my hand there. Yeah. 
Now you yeah, call me on sure. my bullshit. <laughs> I, yeah, I called you on your bullshit of rhyming dictionary. You called me on my bullshit of open oh micing you on, on a podcast <laughs> interview. <laughs> Oh my god, bro. Let me ask you a question. So you you tour. So you, you go around from like from venue to venue. Where can like people find find your shit? You know, like where can they um see you check out your best thing to find out everything that is dead air dennis is deadairdennis.com. D-E-A-D-A-I-R-D-E-N-N-I-S dot com. The nickname, by the way, Dead Air, comes from my radio days. Uh, Dead Air is an ironic nickname. I don't stop talking. Dead Air means silence. It's like calling a fat guy tiny. That's basically what uh, the name comes from. I think calling a fat guy tiny is cute. You (laughs) just want to squish him. (laughs) It's patronizing. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, uh, so my social media is there. You can find links to my Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it. X shit or whatever you want to call it. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all of it at Dead Air Dennis. I am really good with the branding and the SEO. (laughs) But yeah, you can find my dumb musings of things I've written, scripts, blog posts. You can find my podcast. So what do you really do? Where I interview artists and entertainers about their day jobs. Um, On the uh, recent episode right now is comedian from Texas, Mitch Burrow, who was on TV, where where lived in LA, was regular at the comedy store, was passed at the comedy store out there. Uh, We have a great conversation about in Plano, Texas, and him being a Marine, a guy who basically got a GED, didn't know what to do his life, became a Marine, changed his life, gave him discipline, gave him a job and a skill set, and then he threw all of that away to become a comedian. It's a good interview. And wow. it's obviously called, and the podcast is called So What Do You Really Do? And is available everywhere podcasts are potted. Dude, that is fucking awesome. I mean, hello. Wow, that was a good chat, bro. Yeah, story of the time. Well, listen, um, if you want to check out more of the podcast, uh, you can find us on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, at Lost in the Groove Pod. So, with that, we'll catch you on later. All right. Bye, everybody. Get home safely. We're all about the artist. That is the whole purpose of this podcast, period. And you have a really valuable tool. You can share this with artists, people that are creative, someone that can uh, enjoy this podcast and really enjoy the experience of Lost in the Groove. So, with that, let's jump back to today's episode, shall we? Hey, it's Dave, and I quickly just wanted to jump in and say, if you've been enjoying the podcast, I'm enjoying this episode, if you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, that'll be so greatly appreciated. Because here's the thing, someone might read that review and make the choice if they want to listen to the podcast. You get to help grow this podcast with us. How fucking cool is that? Let's jump back to today's episode.